Praise God. God is bringing favor to the body of Christ. See, favor and vengeance go together. Because you've got to have favor to get out of God's vengeance way. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Would you grab your swords and go to Genesis 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Let's speak it together. And the sons of God, which are the angels, saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God, the angels, came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. And these were the mighty men who were of old and men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. I know we got three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Is the earth filled with violence now? Yeah. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. So we see something that happened here. There was a cry. Now, you got to remember something. Believe me, Noah was not quiet about everything. This was going on for 400 years. Amen. He was watching humanity being taken over. He was watching these giants eat humans. He was watching all of this stuff happen. But he had favor from God, and Noah was protected. If you remember, Job was protected. Why? Because they offered sacrifices of animals. I'm sure Noah offered sacrifices of animals, just like Job did in protection. But the earth was being corrupted to genetics, there was hybrids, offsprings of darkness. There was perversion. And God finally looked at it because he heard the cry of Noah. You don't think Noah was just silent? You don't think he cried out to God for many years saying, help, help? And the Lord finally answered him. And when he answered him, he said, build an ark. In other words, get in it. Here's your exodus. This is what we call the first exodus. Exodus chapter 3. Now you got to remember something that's pretty powerful because, you know, the cry of Noah turned the heart of God to intercede. So Noah builds this huge ship. It floated above the land. And it was and, and everything drowned. All animals, everything drowned. Even the birds died because when the earth was filled with water, they had nowhere to go. I'm surprised they didn't all go to Noah's Ark. Everything that had breath, including the birds, died. And in Exodus 3 and verse 7,
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry, their what? Their cry, because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, and the Hevites, Jezebites. Now these were all tribes of giants. These were all the lineage of Cain. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh, he's talking to Moses, that you may bring my people out, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And it shall be a sign to you that I sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this, mount on this mountain. So we see here is another cry. We heard the cry of Moses. I mean, we heard the cry of Noah. And we heard the cry of of Moses in the Egyptian and, and the Israelites who were taking bondage. Now Egypt is the same same thing. At that time they were all up from the Nephilim race. Amen. So you see here even though that there were giants then but that same race was still ruling the earth. In Exodus 14 started 13 and Moses said to the people do not be what? Afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, his chariots and horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and what? His horsemen. And the angel of the Lord God went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them in the pillar of cloud, went before them and stood between them. So, he, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. This is, this, it, thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by the night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all that, all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters <clears throat> were a wall to them on the right side and on the left side. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. <laughs> he took off their chariot wheels. It's like somebody stealing hubcaps at night, you know? <laughs> Praise God. But God was disarming them. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, uh, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, 
that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, with the morning appeared, and the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were, uh, were a wall to them on the right and on the left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so that the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord in his servant Moses. This was the second exodus. Now, the first one was floating on the water. This one, God divided the water. Amen? This was the second exodus. <clears throat> Why? Because of the cries of the people. We, what we're seeing right now is what I call an eternal cry. There are cries all over the world up to God right now. Probably like never before. Why? Because there's so much trouble and so many things going on. There's cries to the Lord. It's called an eternal cry. They are groaning. There's a cries going up to the Lord all the time. So there's praise and worship going on. Amen? For ambushing. And there's cries going on to move the heart of God. And I believe that the cries have reached heaven so much so powerful that God is bringing vengeance and he's also bringing favor. Amen? Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Speak it. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall, shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Again, the voice, the eternal cry. The eternal cry, crying in the world is, prepare the way of the Lord. Again, there is an eternal cry today, globally, and it's increasing. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1. You know, there's so much uh, inhumane acts and uh, attacks against humanity. In fact, um, one of the major attorneys that won a lawsuit in California to remove the masks from the children going to school was here in Florida. And they were at some event. And this morning I went into Publix and a friend of mine that I know very well ran into her and she said, man, that attorney's at her house. I said, cool. So her and a group of people filed a lawsuit against Biden administration for inhumane acts. There are so many lawsuits against this administration. So many lawsuits. The courts are overfilled with lawsuits. It'll take years to go through. Hopefully some of them get real quick. There's gonna, that, that may be just cause a transfer of wealth right there. All of the lawsuits. <laughs> and John chapter 1 verse 14. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Yeah, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only the glory of the as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Hmm. Not, no one had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He said, No. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from Pharisees. And they asked him saying, Why then do you baptize as if you are not Christ, the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Now think about this. Here's the water again, the baptism of the water, another preparation of exodus, but this exodus is of sin. Is everybody okay? Verse 27. It is he who's coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. These things were done in the Bethereba, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again, the voice from heaven, the eternal cry. Amen? And what was he crying out? Repent. Again, the water cleansing. Remember the first exit was the water cleansing with Noah? Amen? I mean with, um, yeah, with Noah. And the second water cleansing was with Moses. Now we see John the Baptist is here cleansing from sin in preparation for the, for the Lord. And Luke chapter 1. Now, this cry is not somebody weeping in the corner, just crying, amen? It's a cry from the heart to change things. It's a cry from the heart asking for help from heaven, from God Almighty. You know how you got here? You had an eternal cry. Amen. Hallelujah. Luke 1, 13. Now the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. I'm going to say that again. He won't drink. <laughs> he won't use drugs. Amen. Why? Because he's coming in the spirit of Elijah to change things around. He's a voice crying from the wilderness. He is carrying the eternal cry of God Almighty. And it says he will turn, um, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children 
and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a what? A people. <laughs> make ready a people prepared for the Lord by sanctifi sanctification and a loyal heart through repentance. Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 1, speak it together. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in the prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? <laughs> Jesus answered and said to them, Go tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And they departed, and Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed with soft Garments, indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesy until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Amen. He was a messenger from God. He had an eternal cry. And Matthew 3. In verse 1. Everybody okay? Now who do you think the Spirit's talking about now? Us. Amen. Us. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now I want you to know he wasn't trying to catch flying locusts and eat them. It was a representation of a nut. So it's nuts and honey. That's how they got that cereal. Everybody remember? Hallelujah. It all came from John the Baptist in the wilderness. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Then um, and, uh, Jerusalem and all Judea confessing that he was arrested. Okay. Now, but when the he had, verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Bro of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down. Hello. And thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water upon, unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. And, he's, he, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. And gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John 
at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Again, there was a repentance. Behold, it, the kingdom of God is at hand. He is the voice in the wilderness. And you got to remember something. He was alone with God. He was without food. Amen. He didn't have a tailor. He didn't have an earthly father to go home to and live anymore. His father was Zacharias. He was a priest. But he didn't have a home. His home was in the wilderness with God. He was alone with God. He carried an eternal cry. He had the cry of the Spirit. God cried through John. The loving, desperate message to humanity to come home. They were all startled when this is going on. Think about that. They were, and they were, you know what happened? They were awakened. They were startled and awakened. Here was this man that had a cry that pierced their hearts. He turned so many souls. He walked in the power of Elijah. But he didn't go around raising the dead. He didn't lay hands on the sick. He carried the cry, the message from God Almighty, as you and I are today. Why? Because the earth is violent. Things are happening. Amen? Is everybody okay? The eyes were opened. <laughs> and when something occurs to them in this awakening, now they desire to know more truth. They wanted to know what was going on. See, when you get alone with God, as John was, you get to a place where you get to know his mind, his thoughts, his desires, his impressions, and his revelations. But if you don't get along with God, you don't get these things. Amen? In 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians 7, verse 8. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I did not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to what? Repentance. For you were made sorry in godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces what? Death. For observe this very thing, that you were sorrowed in godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, and all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Now, this is something powerful here because uh, he's talking about the cry of repentance. You know, and, and I've shared this before already, that when I repented to God, when I had my visitation for the Lord, before anything really happened, I asked for forgiveness. And within seconds, there was a sorrow within me that I had no control. It was the most painful experience I ever had in my being, in my spirit, in my gut. You know, you can, you, you can see, you can be very grieved in something and cry and, and be sorrowful. Amen? But this was beyond that. It was beyond a natural type of thing. You know, because you can stop crying and be sorrowful. Amen? I could not. I had no control of it at all. It was so excruciating and so powerful. Um, it was beyond human understanding that I had no control or ability to stop. Only God did. He chose to stop it. 
It was his cry for the loss of humanity. Because when I heard come out of my mouth, why are you allowing me to feel your pain? That's what I heard. Even though I was, I mean, I was, I was ripped. I was so ripped apart. I never had such sorrow. I mean, it's never happened again like that. I had no control of it. But I felt the cry of God Almighty for the loss for your humanity. And as this began to happen, all of a sudden I saw, do you ever see those um, like puzzles where they have dots and you have to put lines together? I saw all humanity connected. There were the dots and God was beginning to connect everyone through the sorrow that I was feeling. I couldn't wait for it to live. I didn't know, I thought I was going to die. If it went any further, I would have died. I couldn't handle it. And then, I, then, and like I said, only he could remove it. I had no control over it. And when he began to lift it, then he began to replace it. And he began to replace it with his presence. Thank God. I wouldn't be here, let me tell you right now. Although I'd be home, but praise God. Hopefully, <laughs> at that time. Hallelujah. And Ezekiel 9. You know, every one of us has a, a moment of sorrow in such a deep way. Amen. Every one of us had. And, and even when we were very sorrowful for some of the things that we've done, we repented and cried over it. And that's what God is looking for in that arena. There's an eternal cry that is being released through us. So that in, through your prayers, it's reaching all of humanity all over the world. And verse 3 in Ezekiel 9. Let's speak it together. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's ink hook at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. In other words, he was sealing them. To the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and do what? Kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. I would say this is God's vengeance. But he had favor on the ones that were releasing an eternal cry. It was a cry of eternity. Utterly, look at verse 6, utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. And he said to them, defile the temple and fill the course with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone. And I fell on my face and cried out and said, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel and pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. I would say our lands are full of bloodshed. Abortion is bloodshed. Somebody get that. And as for me also, my eye was neither spear, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then the man clothed with linen, who had the ink hook at his right side, reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Those that were marked, these were sealed, those who cried out against the evil forces and against those who are doing inhumane acts. I believe that that's happening right now. I believe that if you're one of those, you've been sealed. You've been sealed already. You already have God's favor. You're protected. Amen? Romans 8. Romans 8.18. 
Listen, not everyone is sealed in that way. There's not every, there isn't many people who, are, who have that eternal cry. There are those who are promoting what's going on or they're turning their heads and trying to ignore it. But then there are those who see it and want to change and want divine intervention and they carry an eternal cry of God. Romans 8.18, let's speak it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For an earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans, that means cries, and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one still see for what he, hope, what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly, eagerly wait for it with perseverance or what we call endurance. Amen? That groan is the eternal cry. In Malachi chapter 3, in verse 1, eternal cry. Let's speak it. I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord their offerings in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old in the former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be swift witness against sorcerers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they did not fear me, says the Lord. I am the Lord and I do not what? Change. These are messengers. Prepare the way by warning. Amen with the truth because they have a eternal cry in Hebrews 12 Hebrews 12:25 everybody okay you getting this are you sealed amen if you're not you will be Hallelujah. Verse 25, let's speak it. See that you do not refuse him who what? Speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promising, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are being shaken as the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving the kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. He is shaken to awaken. Amen? The earth He's going to cause a rumble to crumble. Amen? Crumble what? Darkness. He's coming with his vengeance and favor. Praise God. To crumble the evil forces. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We need to get to a place where we're not crying for ourselves. We're crying for the lost. In verse 12, please. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who yeah. boast in appearance and not in heart. Ooh. 
For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creation. All things pass away, and all things become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, let me tell you something. It isn't going to come without an eternal cry. Amen. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are what? Ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, and that the world may see Christ in us. And I'm going to close at Psalm 30. See, if you don't have a prayer life and a close relationship with the Lord, you're not going to have a cry. You'll be crying too much for yourself. Oh, Lord, I need. <laughs> You'll always lack. You'll have enough, never have enough to bring a false fulfillment. In verse 1, let's speak it together. Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you what? You healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord. The Lord made supplication, and I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned me from my mourning into what? Dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever and ever and ever. So he cried out to God. Amen. God makes a way. I'm telling you right now, there are so many things going on. We are in such a critical time, and there's a big transition happening. More and more things are increasing. More arrests are being taken. More and more people are getting put out, and there's more exposure. Now, you've got to remember something. Uh, they're trying to bring more things down on people. Amen. I, I just read that they just uh, some places have extended uh, their um, mandates and everything where people still can't leave their homes in other countries. They've extended it. Some of them have extended it permanently until further notice. So you talk about these people can't go to work or nothing in other countries. They're, de they're causing people to depend on the government. The government gets them sick. The government gets them sicker. And they put them all under control. This is all the exposure of the Antichrist regimes all over the globe. Amen? There's got to be a heart, a cry of the Spirit, an eternal cry from God. So it's God crying out through you, me and you to move him. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And Lord, we don't want to take this lightly because we know that there's a tremendous need. So help us, Lord, to become intercessors, one that cries out for the lost and the abomination and wicked works 
that the evil has done, that you may destroy their works, Lord, and rescue those who have been taken captive, mentally, physically, and spiritually, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.